Hello. My name is BJ Paris. Welcome to Tapping Into His Treasures. How is everybody? There. I'm doing well, and I hope you are too. I look a little winded today because I was out walking in the wind. I went out earlier to the bank with all this coronavirus stuff going on. I just wanted to um, put a little more money in there in case um, I have to order anything by mail, even food. At least there'll be some cash in the bank so I could do that. But it wasn't this windy this morning. It was very, very nice. And all of a sudden, blah, blah. So I'm a little windblown right now. But I did want to talk a little bit more about um, the virus and what we're going through. And not knowing what's going to happen by the end of the weekend, this uh, individual states are closing down. And oh, there's just so much on our minds. But I just want to bring out again, as I did in the last show, how God is with us and is going to come through and lots of things are going to happen. They, uh, they always, situations like this always make us stronger and we learn from them. And um, it's not all bad. There's always light at the end of the tunnel. So let's see, we're going to start in the book of Ruth. And I just want to read one short chapter in Ruth chapter 1. And I chose that one because they went through a lack of food and things like that. And we could identify with, with her. Many could identify with her. Okay, so. So the book of Ruth chapter 1, and you know who Ruth is, Naomi's daughter-in-law. So in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And we are having a famine right now, a famine of sorts. You know, there may be a shortage of food, but not everybody is without food. But we are in a famine uh, concerning sickness and things like that. So a certain man of Bethlehem of Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He, his wife, and his two sons. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi, and his two sons were named Melon, which meant invalid, and Chilean, which meant pining. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem of Judah. They went to the country of Moab and continued there, but Elimelech, who was Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. And they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They dwelt there about 10 years. And Mahon and Chilion died also, both of them. So the women was bereft, the woman rather, the one, Naomi, was bereft of her two sons and her husband. Can you imagine leaving Bethlehem and having food and everything that you wanted and lived, loved in your home and everything, going to this place and having your husband and your two sons die? That's terrible. So anyway, she, starting at verse 6, she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in Moab how the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. Now, these are only like two verses apart, but in actuality it was like 10 years or longer apart. So uh, she had heard that the Lord visited his people giving them food. So she left the place where she was, her two daughters-in-law with her, and they started on the way back to Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The dead meaning her, uh, her two sons. The Lord, excuse me, the Lord grant that you may find a home and rest, each in the house of her husband, then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. And they said to her, No, we will, re we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband tonight and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? 
No, my daughters, it is far more bitter for me than for you that the hand of the Lord is going out against me. Then they wept aloud again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. To her. And Naomi said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Urge me not to leave you or to turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more so also, if anything but death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said, No more. So they both went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred about them and said, Is this Naomi? And she said to them, Call me not Naomi, which means or meant pleasant. Call me Mera, bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. I'm not going to read the, uh, the rest uh, verbatim. So you know the rest of the story, most of you, though, just to refresh your memory. Or if you've never heard the story before, it won't be a refreshment, but I'll just uh, tell you a few words of it. So they went back, and uh, Naomi sent Ruth out to the fields to glean from what the, uh, glean, what the uh, harvesters harvested. And there is, that's where she met Boaz, the, the one who was in charge of the, the whole enterprise. And uh, there was a lot more to that story, but... Uh, what ended up happening was they ended up getting married, Boaz and Ruth, and that is the couple that God used in genealogy to to um, bring forth the Lord Jesus Christ to this earth as a baby. It went all the way back in lineage to Ruth. So we're, we're, there was a famine and everything was going against the people and they went to uh, Moab and it wasn't, it wasn't a, a peaceful town like Beth, Bethlehem. Um, you know, people were like, there was a lot of evil there and people were uh, just living, living for the devil. So it was very tough for them to be there. Just like when St. Patrick went to Ireland, it was like for him going into hell when he went to preach about the uh, Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So anyway, it seemed like the situation was never going to get over with, but God always comes through with the light at the end of the tunnel, and he did. He brought Naomi back to Bethlehem. He used her daughter-in-law to be uh, of the lineage of Jesus Christ coming to earth. How much better can it get than that? And uh, that was like light at the end of the tunnel for sure, because uh, Ruth, in fact, was, was King David's uh, something like great-great-great-grandmother. So that's where that lineage comes in, of the royal, royal birth of Christ. So after that, let's see. I know the story of um, redemption, of God causing something terrible to bring something good into the picture. And it was uh, found in John, John 4, 49, about the boy who, about the boy who died. Let's see, John 4, that's, um, hmm, hold on. John 4, 49. Okay, it's, um, John 4, 49. It's about Je when Jesus was on earth. And the king's officer pleaded with him, meaning Jesus, Sir, do come down at once before my little child is dead. Jesus answered him, Go in peace. Your son will live. 
And the man put his trust in what Jesus said and started home. But even as he was on the road going down, his servants met him and reported, saying, Your son lives. So he asked them at what time he had begun to get better. They said, Yesterday during the seventh hour, about one o'clock in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father knew that it was at that very hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. And he and his entire household believed, adhered, adhered to, and trusted in, and relied on Jesus. This is the second sign, wonder work, miracle, that Jesus performed after he had come out of Judea into Galilee. So there's another case of uh, a child so near death, and just the word, Jesus wasn't even near the boy, and the father had to travel, because if you picked up on that, the father didn't encounter the servants until the next day. So there was a lot of traveling involved. And but the, but the day before when the miracle happened, Jesus wasn't even near that child. He was like in a different town. It's just the words that he spoke. Um, and all those miles away, the child, the fever left the child. So praise the Lord. Another example of a terrible situation that God changed. And he's going to do the same for us. You know, because when this virus is over with and it's conquered, it's not going to be the complete end of it, as they were saying on TV, you know, the doctors and, and uh, officials. There are going to be other viruses that are bad. They won't be as bad as this one, but this one is teaching us how to deal with things. So when the rest of them come, it's not going to hit everybody like bomb. So, so that's two, and I had a couple more here. Uh, what came to mind is the little girl, her name was Tapitha. I'm not sure where it was. I looked for it in the concordance and I couldn't find it. So maybe it was uh, in the Acts of the Apostles. I'm not sure. But I think she was around 12 years old and she was dead. And Jesus went into her room and he made sure everybody got out. And dealt. he just stretched out his arm and he said, little girl, arise and uh, walk or something to that effect. And she did, and then he presented her to her parents, who were overjoyed and overwhelmed, of course. And can you imagine how sad it had to be for a 12-year-old girl to die, For her, how bad it had to be for her parents? I remember when I was a young girl, about 11 years old, and my father's cousin's 12-year-old daughter was killed in a car wreck. She had been to some kind of a teen uh, outing or something like that to do with teenagers in a church, perhaps. And so it was the first time I ever went to a funeral parlor and saw a dead person. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to see that because it stayed with me for a long, long time. But anyway, I remember the sadness and the despair in the parents. It was, it was just not easy to forget. It just stayed on my heart. My heart was so heavy for a long time after that. But can you imagine how the parents rejoiced when Jesus raised her from the dead? And uh, I think maybe that was the portion of scripture where he had them get her something to eat. I'm not sure. But anyway, those are four examples of um, three examples. And I had one more. Lazarus, of course, was the most famous story. When he was dead, he made sure he didn't go back and keep him from dying because there wouldn't have been as much of a testimony had he done that. You know, like his sister, was it Mary said, if you were here, my brother would not have died. Um, I mean, it could have been Martha, but I thought it was Mary. And he waited until the corpse was smelling and everything. He just waited. Um, so people had to give glory to God the Father, you know. And here they were so sad, and all the townspeople, their friends, they were so very sad. And uh, Jesus raised Lazarus to the dead, from the dead. And here we are still talking about it 2,000 years later. So there's another example of the light at the end of the tunnel. Beautiful, beautiful, bright light. Brand new beginnings. And just the wondrous deeds of the Lord through Christ coming, happening. Beautiful story. So I want to read a psalm. Psalm 66, 12 that God gave me this morning. 
Psalm 66, 12. 66. Here we are. Uh, he's been giving me verses pertaining to um, this period of quarantine that we're all going through. Uh, self-isolation and quarantine just to stay away from other people to prevent the spread of the coronavirus and um, somehow they all pertain to what we're going through so 6612 you won't get it you may not get it right away but this is what he gave me it's really 12b the first part is not pertaining to the virus but I'll read it anyway you caused men to ride over our heads when we were prostrate. We, okay, that first part. But to me that means, you know, when you're prostrate, pros, prostrate, you're flat on your face, and you're down. You know, as far as the meaning of the verse, it's life circumstances. You may down, be down in your spirit. You may down because of bad news. You may be down emotionally. You're just down, down. Um, so you're down, and when you're that way, you don't have any strength like to fight back or uh, to be strong. You don't have any strength to combat the enemy or even rely on Christ to combat the enemy. You're just kind of blah. You're helpless. And when you're in that state, it's like the men in their chariots are riding over you because you're helpless. So on to the next part of the verse, uh, part B, it says, we went through fire and through water, but you brought us out into a broad, moist place, in parentheses, to abundance and refreshment in the open air. Well, uh, what I've learned in the past, and I believe this is the meaning of the verse, is that for God to bring us out into a broad, moist place, uh, that speaks of the body of Christ here on earth, of the church people, born-again Christians, um, that we can become a family with. It's just a beautiful place. We integrate together, and uh, God uses one uh, to bless another here, and that one to bless another there, to learn from one another, to even um, correct one another. And in the Proverbs, I believe it is, it says that iron sharpens iron. So yes, you will use one body member uh, or a church member to sharpen the iron of the other, other one. In love, never in judgment, just to help them along. So, so we're there for each other, you know, not only for uh, sweet tidings to one another, or not only to help one another, uh, or to encourage one another, but also for the other, to help them along in their journey and in their spiritual growth. So God brings us into this wonderful, what he calls broad, broad moist place, because when, when the word dry is used in the Bible, that talks of like a desert with no water and um, no moisture, just dry or even lifeless. So he uses this word broad, moist, Moist is, you know what moist means, you know, richness and fullness and uh, uh, just not dry. And thank God for what he brings us into, the church, the, the place where God's glory dwells. Um, Jesus is the vine and we are the branches, so we are the branches of that spiritual tree, and God brings us into that place. And you know, in the springtime, when a when a, a tree thrives, you know, after being uh, dead, really alive but dead, alive slash dead for the whole winter, it's feeding itself all winter long. But at the same time, on the outside, no leaves are showing or any signs of life are showing on the outside. But anyway, in the spring, when those leaves become alive, all of a sudden you just see life. And then the birds go into the branches and they're tweet, tweet, tweeting. And so I love them when I hear them in the morning now because it's not time quite yet when they're waking you up at 4, 15 a.m. when they start chirping in the summer. So they're not chirping until about 6.30, quarter to 7. So I know personally I can just lay in bed and um, uh, say my prayers. Uh, sometimes I get up and I kneel, but 
most of the time I just I just sit there and put the cover over my head sometimes like Jesus did with his shawl and uh, I pray and uh, it's not till the end of my prayer uh, until they start chirping and it sounds so sweet and I'm glad I got some prayers in before they started because it's such a pleasant sound and it, uh, I'm afraid it interrupts my prayers because I'm listening to the birds and praying at the same time. So maybe you know what I'm getting at there. So, let's see. So he brings us into the moist place, a broad moist place, to abundance and refreshment in the open air. And just to uh, add to that subject, it is a place of abundance because receiving the word of God from one another and being built up or getting the right word at the right time and they're giving you a witness to something that the God the Holy Spirit has given to you and the person doesn't even realize it. You know, I did the same thing on the phone this morning with my, my lifelong friend from Connecticut. Uh, I was, uh, I was uh, praying with her about somebody in her family and I used a, another name instead of the person's name. And she goes, why, why aren't you calling that? And I says, I don't know, what's his middle name? And sure enough, his middle name was the name that I used in the prayer. And I didn't even know it. So it was the Holy Spirit praying through me. And God was gonna answer that prayer even though I used the middle name rather than the first name. So anyway, so lastly, uh, it's a place of refreshment. You know how you re feel refreshed when you get out of the shower? Especially if it's a hundred degrees in the summertime and you take a cool shower, you are refreshed. Man, are you refreshed. And that is what the body of Christ, the church, does for each individual body member, church member, God's child, all of God's people. That's what he does. He refreshes us. And uh, most of us are on Facebook a lot more now during the crisis and time of quarantine. But... We're doing it online, we're like in the loop. And we're praying online even when there is no crisis. Uh, and our, we're praying corporately. And our prayers, you know, one prayer will initiate somebody else to say something else, re related or unrelated. It's just like the spirit going from one household to the other to the other. And it's just a time of refreshment. And lastly, um, he brings us into the open air. Well, right now they're telling us because of the virus, we need to get out for fresh air. And the quarantine is so specific about staying near your houses. They, they don't want us to even take a walk downtown um, or any place. I went to the bank this morning just to put some money in and there was not one person on Main Street not one. I did see two people walking dogs on two side streets on the way home. D downtown, not one person. But they do stress um, the, the media and for the officials, they stress to go out as much as possible into the air to get fresh air because especially elderly people were in the houses all the time and are, are what do you call it? our sensors in the nose, um, we just get used to the same smell over and over again. So if there is any uh, stagnant smell or anything like that, we're not gonna smell it because our sensors are all used up. So we can't smell anything like that. Just like if you have a dog that smells, you can't smell it, but other people can because your sensories for the dog smell are all used up and, and you can't smell it. In other words, you're so used to it because you're around it all the time so, so you don't have that ability to smell um, the dog, if, if indeed the dog smells. So yeah, it's important for us to get out in the open air. It's healthy. And, and that's what, what God is saying here, what the Spirit is saying in this portion of Scripture. He brings us into the open air, meaning to be a member in particular of the church body. So if you want to write that down, it's uh, Psalm 66. 12b there oh and i just want to let's see how much time i have 
what did I write that down? 50? I just have a few more minutes, so I just wanted to tell you that if you're in a, a quarantine situation right now, or whatever, I just wanted to say that God is very personal to each and every one of us when we go through ordeals like this. And He knows what you're going through. And believe me when I tell you, He doesn't only do some of us, He does it to all of us. But the thing of it is, our antennas have to be up, we have to be listening. He may be doing or saying something to you, and you're just, it's going over your head, you're not receiving it. You have to put yourself in a place that you receive it. Mm -hmm. And you can do that. Just on purpose, listen, heed with your inner ear. Heed, pay attention to what's going on around you. And ask yourself, could God be in this? Could God be in this? And I'll bet you, I bet you he is in it. You just have to listen for him and to respond to him when he is in it. And he's beautiful that way. And I just want to tell you, I didn't even realize this until last night. Now, this thing has been going on, this quarantine thing has been going on for a couple of weeks now. And I didn't realize this till last night. Um, I was just laying there in bed, and all of a sudden it came to me, loud and clear. Definition. Well, God said to me, he showed me, he reminded me, for several months, maybe eight or nine months, ten months, I've been getting it, I don't want to say every day or every week, but I've been getting it probably every every two to three weeks for several months that we were going to be with just um, one or two months of food and we have to, we're having to stretch that food until the next time we were able to get to the store somehow or get food. And uh, every time that I got it, I would say, well, I know that may happen in the future, but I don't think we're ready for that yet. I, don't, I just don't think it's going to happen yet. And every time it would come, I would react that same way. It's not time yet, so it can't be, it can't be a, a quarantine situation yet. And here we are in it right now. And it just dawned on me last night. So God was telling me ahead of time that this was going to happen. Because he's that kind of a God. And he does say in his word that he shares these secrets and these predictions with his friends. And we think of ourselves as friends of God and friends of Jesus. So he was telling me before I even had ears to hear. So I wasn't listening as sharply as I should have been. But now he's told me and I have heard him loud and clear. And just one more quick thing. Oh, I'm losing time here. Uh, with the movie, I Am Patrick. I waited for six months to see that movie. I wanted to see it so bad. And of course, I can't, go the, nobody can go, I'm not going to the movie theater. I don't even think they're open during this crisis. But anyway, they announced on 700 Club yesterday that the movie's going to be available through them on DVD. And I, it's, what do you call it? I don't know, but you get in touch with them by calling this certain number and you're able to watch it online. Either that or you can order a DVD one or the other. So anyway, I am praising God for that because I, I was so disappointed that I missed the movie. And now I'm going to be able to watch it. So little things like that. God is behind them. So let's together, all of us, 